nozzle stuff. So we're really not looking for no big debate. We got the, my main man, Kyle. I don't know which side Kyle's on, but Kyle over here. So everybody, uh, welcome aboard. This is kind of like a live session of the Jump Seat uh, podcast. Hopefully with your all's permission, we will put this out as a podcast episode. Today is 7-8 of 2020, the day of the nozzle. Uh, I, my name is Ryan. I'm a self-proclaimed uh, fog nozzle fan. So go ahead and throw your boos up in the chat over there. Boo. Boo, Boo this man. Nozzles. Boo. <laughs> so uh, today being the day of the nozzle, we threw this out in the engine company resurrection. Hey, listen, uh, I'm a recovering truck addict and I'm learning the, they're learning the engine. So uh, some people say I got demoted from the truck company back to the engine. I think I got promoted to being the boss of the engine company. And Kyle, I want to start today's discussion with, uh, I want you to kind of, to describe, this is something that I took from your, from your session that you did. Explain to the guys on here, what's the drop? Where's the drop and what is it? And keep talking, I'm gonna go change my headphones. Uh, the drop point is essentially where you set up the attack line to make your push, whether it be, you know, stairwell, stretch dry in a multifamily or front door A side on a single family double, or a two story. Wherever you're entering the structure, um, residential versus commercial, little differences, depending on what your uh, goal is. But essentially for residential, for me, drop uh, default is front door A side um, for the majority of what we're doing, unless we audible. And then uh, commercial is gonna be the path of least resistance to the fire, whether whatever door that is. Um, whether the, the fire's in a trash can in the main dining area, or if the fire is in the kitchen, you know, those made two different doors will lead me to both of those places. It just depends on so, the fire. So why is it always the A side? And that's a question I had for you, Kyle, is, is, is and, and listen, I'm the new guy here. I'm not an expert of engine work. If you want to talk about force splinter and double lead, <laughs> that's me. But tell me why the drop is always default to A side. Uh, so for me, default A side, because it gives me direct access to the floor plan of the structure. So I'm entering the structure as the first new engine to put myself between fire and victims. And the best way that I can counter those victims per the studies that are out that we're reading data on is put myself in passive travel, passive egress. And so that's why I want to enter the front door A side. I get direct access to the hallway where the bedrooms are. And depending on where you're construction is leading you locally is whether or not you get direct access to the stairs or the basement stairs if you have uh, basements in your district or uh, just depends on where where the uh, like I said the construction is leading you in your district but my district front door a, a side is going to be audible or uh, default for me unless it's not audible so when you call out that audible you as the first do are you going to call it out and say hey guys we're stretching to xyz is that something you announce over the radio? And do you give a reason why? Or is that just something that, hey, listen, I'm the dictator today, and this is what I'm saying? No, nah, we don't have huddles, man. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't stand over the radio unless I was just separated from my crew. But initially, when we pull up, there's going to be some pretty big telltale signs for me to tell them to audible. Because default for me, like I said, residential is front door A side. So my fireman is hooking them there until I tell him something different. And he knows me well enough to where he can read my mind, so to speak, in some certain situations. Like if the whole front porch is collapsed or oh, gotcha. we've got a attached garage, you know, that's um, that the main body of fire is in, you know, then we're obviously going to audible there, depending on what the conditions inside the structure tell us, whether we're going to blitz and then go in or go in first. And then the second dude's going to blitz just depends on what the strategy is. All right, Cal. So now we've made it to the drop. You've got your hose to the drop. Now, I, Corey, unmute your microphone. This is the most unique explanation and problem that I think anybody could have. So we talked about Cal. I was talking about Corey the other day. Corey is on an engine company in a rather large metropolitan East Coast fire department. And when I say large, I mean it may be the biggest in the world, second only to one person. And he was like, hey, Ryan, I love going parallel to the structure, but where we're at, it always has to be perpendicular or the truck monkeys are gonna roll over, run over the hose. So Corey, describe what you were telling me, the challenges that you have in the urban area as far as lining up the drop with, with the stretch. Uh, one of our biggest problems is, well, I'm in a tight area, a lot of engines on top of each other and trucks are on top of each other. So we're talking about five units going on scene in 30 seconds all together. 
nice so problem to have. No, there, there is no lag time. So if you if you're trying to stretch down the street, you're going to get hit by the truck, and a certain house might just hit you in pits. Um, so we try to get to the sidewalk as best we can, but the street is out of play for us. The street's out of play at all for stretching hose because it's going to end up under a tormentor, an outrigger. You just then you're fighting traffic, double parked cars. So the faster we get to the sidewalk, the better. And then most of our areas, uh, the typical New York brownstone. So you have that stoop up to the second floor. So when I'm getting there as the nozzle man, I'm actually going to flake my entire length is going to go beyond the fire building in the direction I was walking. So as we move in and nice and easily pulls through that front gate. And we can move right up the stoop, no problems. If it's a little higher story, we might be able to get inside, but second or third floor, we're usually going to charge outside, but you want to like out down the sidewalk in the direction you were walking past your fire building. And that's what, Cal, you were talking about when you're perpendicular. That's okay, but now you've got that one guy. I loved your explanation. I'm going to share it with the group. I'm completely stealing your stuff right now. It's like, would you, be, would you want to be that one guy that showed up to a working house fire and stayed at the front door the entire time? It's like, man, that was a ball-busting fire, but, yeah, I got to stay by the front door the entire time. So, I mean, yeah. can you talk about that a little you're bit? Not have, uh, you're not going to have a choice. Right. You know, like in his situation, there is no choice. You know, there's no real estate that we can take up with this hose line that's not going to impede our progress other than that, you know. So, obviously, he's going to have to burn a guy there or somebody's going to have to work that pinch point, you know. But it's a decision that had to be made, you know, or else um, you're going to have people trampling all over all over your lines like he was saying. Yeah. But best case scenario is for me is clean forward in line with the drop, meaning perpendicular to the wall that I'm entering. Um, and that will take out that first pinch point for me. But I'm dealing with a drastically different staffing level than my man here. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 Cal, you've, you've gotten in, right? And, and I'm going to preview some of the people. We started a conversation here before, and this is something that as far as moving the nozzle, explain to me what you, you said, and I don't even know how to even explain this, Cal, is, Everything is in support of the nozzle. The truck companies to support the nozzle. The, the search may not be supporting the nozzle, but it, it's in coordination with. Why is it so important for everybody to have that nozzle focus? I, your explanation was fantastic, by the way. Well, the biggest thing, and like I was saying earlier before we got started, is the everything on the fire ground is in support of the nozzle, and the nozzle is in support of the search. You know, that's why we're going in. Either we're searching, we're searching on the way to the fire, or the immediate area that we're encountering on the, on the um, trip to the fire room. And then we're supporting the search behind us, you know, so. Oh, sorry, Kyle. I'm, I muted you. Hang on, buddy. Sorry, I'm back. Yeah. Sorry about that. I'm a oh, no worries, operator. <laughs> yeah. I'm from the land of no trucks, man. You know, so our stack up crew on what we use is our search crew. So we, we stack up the first two companies and my man from New York, we stole it from him. You know, we marry the companies together because we have to. Right. You know, so in single family dwelling, I got two turns to the fire room. I'm not real worried about having two extra guys. You know, I can manage those two pinch points and my driver can be the door, you know, in, unless he's throwing ladders or, you know, wrestling a homeowner or something like that in the front yard. And then we'll set up for that. But uh, if I'm going, Top side, Division Two, Charlie side, I'm going to need another crew to help me get there, you know. And anybody that tells you difference never taking a charge line from the front door up the back, you know, staircase to the back Charlie side of the structure. Yeah, and and I, re I really think that that, that, de that deserves some time. And maybe, Pip, I know that your staffing level like that is stacking your crews. I mean, not all of us are blessed with, with Corey staffing or some other people staffing. When you put those – we're supporting the nozzle, and if the first line's not going to where it needs to go, everything slowed down. And I wish Sean was on here. Uh, Buffalo got in a pin, got in a pickle there not too long ago. I'm sorry. A large metropolitan fire department in northeastern <laughs> New York State got in, it got in a pinch the other day because them as the truck company crew uh, was going up to make a rescue. Confirmed rest. I mean, 100% they knew that there was somebody in there. And the engine company went around to make their push, and they found another victim. 
So all of a sudden now the truck's going for a known rescue and the engine company's made their stretch to the Charlie side to tack the seat down the hallway and now you're not getting water on the fire and the whole wide world went to poop in a hand basket. So yeah, you I mean, train for that. My man Jay Bonfield's got a great story about that, about discovering a victim on the nozzle. Is Jay, is Jay, Jay on sure. here? Yeah. Is Jay on here? Jay, I'm here. I'm here. Come on, Jay. Spill the guts. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's so we've had a couple of them recently. One one of them was uh, my myself, and basically what what ended up happening was uh, when we showed up, the house was you know pretty much chugging smoke, and and uh, the cops were running around trying to you know figure out where the person was there was a report of somebody in there and we kind of kind of had a good suspicion where she was and and uh so they start breaking out windows with their mag lights and kicking in doors and all that kind of stuff and in you know a few seconds of me stretching the line and masking up and place turned into a you know into a blowtorch pretty quick and so when i when i started push in you know i kind of had to fight my way up on the deck and then drop down to a knee and, and, uh, continue on in and, and, uh, found her about, you know, seven feet, seven, eight feet inside the front door there. And there was still, you know, two rooms burning on, on the backside there. So, you know, for us, our, you know, we get, we get drilled pretty hard that, uh, you know, Pipeman stays on the fire. I stayed on the fire. My officer bumped up and, and, uh, dealt with the victim and, you know, brings, Anytime there's a, a bump up that happens, brings a little bit of spare hose because then I need to I need to get it around that corner. So uh, if we're we were in the living room, there's two bedrooms and a bathroom burning still. If I would have just basically hunkered down there, um, it would have just been a you know shit show trying to get her out of there. So it was I was hunkered down for a second. He brought up a bite of hose, told me to go ahead. I continued on, uh, at least got into the junction point, the mesh point between the three rooms there that were, that were going, was able to, uh, you know, at least get water through the doorway in those rooms while he worked on her. And, uh, you know, she, she didn't make it, which uh, is unfortunate, but at least, you know, that's a, a pretty well planned operation of what to do when the nozzle finds a person. Um, you know, we've had, we've had uh, a rash of a few of those. And I think that just having that, that drilled in from day one that the pipeman's job is just stay on that fire and try to get a little bit of access hose to get them around the corner is, is super, super critical to drill on. And Kyle, there's a lot of takeaway right there. I mean, my question to you was, Jay, were you flowing as you pushed on down that hallway or did you go yeah. half bail going down? And see, that's a question maybe for the group. And this is something, listen, guys, I'm not the expert at this. Pip, tell them, Ryan is not the expert at engine work. It's not me. So is that, a determining factor to being able to flow going down because of the conditions, needs, and assessment there, guys? Ed Edward's shaking his hand. Edward, if you want to unmute, buddy, this is, this is everybody's welcome to join in. Absolutely. I, I was, I was flowing. Um, I, I had the line open, you know, from, from the second I worked my way up on the porch on that fire. Um, you know, we, it, as soon as that nozzle dropped, like even with the line open, as soon as that nozzle dropped down low, like to pick up the lower register of the room that I, the living room that I was in, um, it was instant, like even through the gear, you could feel everything kind of coming back up over the top. And actually when I moved in, um, I missed the, the wall. So the wall that the front door was on, you know, I kind of had my stream going straight ahead towards the back rooms where the, where the fire was coming from and I was working that. And I, I missed that back wall or that room, that wall that I passed. And uh, so when I got in right before I got into that junction between the three rooms, that back wall um, that had gotten kind of partially knocked down, she had a bunch of like bookshelves and all sorts of stuff on that wall. While all that fresh air coming in behind me kind of took that thing and lit it off again. Right. And uh, so it was a good reminder, you know, to turn back around and make sure you, you, you know, get everything wet, go 90 left, 90 right, you know, and, and then as you move through into the center of the room, you got to come back off briefly, get that back wall again that you moved past that wasn't getting wet, the drywall, whatever you want to call it. 
before you continue on your journey there because it, it popped back and you know my, my cap was was working on working on getting that victim is like oh shoot far behind far behind and so edward come on man jump in there buddy listen we're, we welcome everybody here at the at the jump seat table <laughs> yeah jay talks about the um the flow and move um not everybody's going to have that skill set that you're going to work with um we work with a lot of volunteer organizations and even the guys in the back of, um, behind me might not have those same skill sets but as an officer or an engine guy senior person that's operating on that fire floor you need to understand your conditions and whether or not you can take space just like jay was talking about he left the line down for just a moment, and it, it ended up um, coming back rather quickly. You may be operating with a 150 or 100, and you just need to sit there for a moment, take some space, and then be able to move forward. And uh, that's just experience, you know. And uh, hey, you know. Hey, Edward, I'm reading the topics here. That's a great feedback. But Kevin, if you can share that. So Kevin wrote in the chat here, the topic right now is it feels a hot one, the fire service. I've had a lot of resistance lately to trying to sell that flowing and moving can be a good thing. Kyle, let me tell you what, son, if you've ever been a slobber knocker, freaking fire, where you've got a person trapped, I don't think it's just not even optional at this point. And I think maybe that being seven, eight today, all right, here I'm coming. All right, Pip, get ready. I'm, I'm, going to the, I'm going to the confessional right now. I'm not Catholic, but I'm confessing that I did use a seven, eight nozzle the other day, and I liked it. I liked it a freaking lot. I'm not a 15, 16 person. I'm a seven eighths guy. That's the, okay. Anyway, but, but I really don't think that I mean, you think the people that resist this have never had that opportunity. I showed you a fire earlier before we got on here, we had to flow and move or you're just not going to get in there. Yeah. Most people that I've found that have extreme resistance to it and it's no, not meant to offend them, but I mean, it is what it is, is that most people either a don't have the skill set to do it or don't have the, uh, mentality that they want to learn how to do it right or B, they've never made that fire yet and they're not real concerned about it you know but just because you haven't made that fire yet doesn't mean it won't come tomorrow you know so conditions drive tactics 90 percent of what we do is going to be hit and move right and you've got to prepare yourself and your crew members for that position where you're entering the choke point and all you have um with you to be able to push through down that hallway is the open nozzle you know, whether your, your attack package is allowing you to do that or not, find that out before you get in the, in the hallway, you know, find out that you can't flow and move 10 feet, you know, because we're talking about 10, 15 feet, you know, the, the training evolutions that you see flowing and moving from the front door are definitely something that you need to have in your back pocket, but starting out, don't try to kill your guys trying to make that push fully like that, get them to where they can push 10, 15 feet and then add a turn in and then add another turn in, and then add the back wall in. And that's where a lot of guys go wrong is they move 900 miles an hour through the parking lot with a crew that's, <laughs> that's never flowed and moved before, and it creates an unrealistic training scar. And then they get inside of a, a structure with even some contents, and they find out they can't move as fast as they were in the open parking lot. You know, we see it all I the time. Our calls it parking lot syndrome. You know, it, it happens all over the place where we go. You know, and, and that pace that you were talking about earlier is very important. And knowing that pace and being able to have that pace in the back of everyone's mind, is it's like a dance. It's like a slow, methodical dance through the structure. And one thing that, that me and Jay were talking about not too long ago is, is imagine the nozzleman being the guy front and center when SWAT teams are clearing a structure. Oh, wow. Uh, in, in tight quarters like that, the nozzle's line of sight. You know, so you, he needs to put himself in a position to where he's lying in sight and then have intentional water. And that's what me and Jay are kind of working on right now is getting guys in the mind frame of having intentional water. What I want the water to do for me and anybody else that's in this room, you know, and being able to, to determine how to intentionally place that water to where things get better and not worse. Yeah, I, I really go back to what Andy teaches and that enhanced stream placement. And it's just putting that putting that that tick in front of them, saying, "Hey, we're painting everything." Uh, Ed, would you add into that, Ed? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, I, it's uh, we we operate with a I call them my stallions. Uh, if they're not herded correctly, they'll they'll go all over the place. <laughs> and you're operating uh, with your fog nozzle. They're, they've been in um, bed with the uh, the fog nozzle for since they've been born. Right. And what I've noticed a lot of times, they're you know reading fire in the front door. They're operating the line for basically a pencil and they're burning their ears. Uh, one of the times is, you know, 
you take some moments of your experiences and just hopefully you're able to bring back your stallions and give them a moment to take that space and so they don't burn their ears. We're not always gonna have the, uh, the luxury of having all the equipment that we want. But if we, whatever we have, we have to own it. Whether it's a you know, 100 PSI nozzle or, a 50, or 50 PSI, it doesn't matter. You may have to just take your, you know, your hit and move. It's the only op- option you have with your 130 pound rookie. Yeah. So well, it, like, Kyle, like Kyle said, and that's something I really didn't want to get into today is, is, is debating this nozzle versus that nozzle. Cause no. most, most of us, we got what we got. I mean, like right yeah, now we're, we're running hundred PSI fog nozzles here in three weeks. Thank the good Lord. We're getting 75s. And, and that's why I think the reason why this discussion came out out of the engine company and, and Lord help him, Dennis Laguerre, how that guy knows that much about moving water and why he studied that much about moving water is beyond me. But I really took home, the under pumping of the 75s down to 70, still getting our target flow about what 146, I think he said. And, and I really think it comes down to, and may, we, we've, we've got it. We've got a special guest coming on and maybe chief Fulmer can talk about this a little bit, but it's taking what package you do have and making it work for you with your staffing in realistic conditions. Chief Fulmer, I'd love to hear your, uh, your two cents about taking the package that you have and put it And what we were talking about chief before you got on here is being able to flow and move. Uh, I, I really don't think that's even optional anymore. I really, really don't. Is he going to talk? He might be on duty. He might not be able to talk. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, boss. Hey, what's going on, guys? What's up, Chief? They're all hey, muted right now. Except for us. <laughs> hey, Kyle. But uh, tell us how you get your guys out to take the package hey, that uh, you have to get them working. Is he still there? Well, let me let me uh, back up. We're fortunate enough about three, three and a half years ago to be able to switch our entire hose and nozzle package. We were uh, running 100 PSI combination selectable gallonage nozzles. Uh, we were running junk hose. So I am part of. No, you're breaking out, Chief. We ended up switching over to order two and a half. And we went with uh, Elkhart uh, 50 PSI. Uh, uh, we run seven, eight smooth bores on uh, one line. And then we run the matching 160 at 50 uh, combi tips. Everything's break apart. Um, so we were real fortunate to get that, uh, that package. And um, it all comes down to the officer on getting guys out the train. You know, if the officer doesn't have buy-in, and the officer isn't motivated and doesn't care, then it's going to reflect on the crew. Um, we stretch line every day. Um, I'm a firm believer that every shift uh, we're putting hose on the ground, whether it's, you know, just pulling the cross lay or the rear attack a couple times or, you know, pulling it for four hours and repacking it. Um, you know, Andy Frederick said the, the medical equipment, the AED can save a life, but uh, – the nozzle in the hands of a low trained fireman can save countless. So that's kind of what we buy into on my shift. And um, yeah, my guys and myself, we put in work. Um, you know, we take some heat, um, but someone says, you know, the haters are dry. So, <laughs> Kev, and, Kevin, uh, Kevin, add to what the Chief's talking about. I, I got your private message. Add on there, buddy. Yeah, I think, uh, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, I actually messaged Kyle about this uh, a little while back and me and him chatted back and forth and it, it, it's definitely buy-in, you know, I think sometimes that's the hardest part when you're trying to make change, whether it's hoses, nozzles, uh, you know, whatever it is in a fire service, you know, people, people don't like to come out of their comfort zone. If they're comfortable with a certain nozzle or a certain hose handling it that way, they don't want to change. So right. trying to sell them on something, I think is the hardest part. And I think a lot of it has to do with your approach. Um, you know, I've been trying to really sell the flowing and moving uh, and low pressure nozzles at the same time. And I, I don't get into the debate about smooth bore versus fog. I think they both have their pros and cons. I think it's just about having a manageable nozzle and the nozzle reaction. And that's the hardest part. I'm trying to really sell getting away from that 100 PSI automatic and getting to something a little bit more manageable because I found that, 
you try to sell the flow and moving and you're doing it with 100 psi automatic and they can't do it so they get discouraged and they don't want to look bad because hey at the end of the day every fireman's proud we want to be proud we don't want to show that we can't do something and i think that that's the thing that we got to get past is you know we got to basically tell everybody hey we're not going to know everything but you need to try something new you're never going to be a great fireman unless you expand yourself from outside your comfort zone well and this is something i'm going to have my buddy my 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 partner in crime the guy's got the best haircut on here on there him and i talk about this all the time uh i'm fat he's fit he wants to be included in stuff but he uses this word when he matter of fact we're gonna do it hopefully tomorrow or friday and it's scaling the exercise and maybe that's when we need to scale back what we're doing so that way we can get and, and Corey, i'm gonna pick on you Corey's the fat one ryan's the fit one that's usually not the way it is the other way but we want to make a Corey inclusive with the group and Pitt, maybe you can add something to that with your experience scaling things for people to get buy-in yeah i think is that me with all the background noise no nope, i think it's somebody else i'll keep muting everybody keep going buddy all right yeah it's funny ryan because as as uh, Kevin was just kind of talking about that and, and Kyle was talking about the parking lot before you know we had, a, we had a job the other night and we pulled up first floor one room off I could see it uh, walked out talked to the neighbor with his garden hose told him you know keep doing a good job man we're going to get it from the inside and you keep spraying <laughs> from out here I uh, gave kept him going right oh, but get a brother I'm thinking here you. it is right yeah oh, dude it was, I'm like keep going man you're doing great but I'm thinking dude we're off we go front door and Kyle was talking about building construction, front door, rooms on the left, there's the windows, but there was no door there. So we had to go down the hallway, all the way to the back of the house, turn around, come all the way back with the line to get moving, to get to where, so by that time we had two rooms off, right? But I had a four person crew, so three people on the engine, and we were able to do all those techniques you guys talked about. We were able to do that because our staffing was good, because we've trained on things, but none of them had any technique to it. We're just putting out the fire. So when we talk about scaling, oftentimes when people talk about like hit and move, oh, I have to do it this way all the time. I have to do it this way. It's always going to be in this parking lot and easy. That may not be the case. And at one point we ran out of line because the person that was supposed to be at the bend, she ran back out to the door to get more. And we couldn't pull that bend. I'm pulling a full house of bend, right? So with scalability to it all, it's that it's just not one way. Just like there's not one way to work out, there's not one way to put out a fire. And, oh boy, am I still here? Nope, keep going. Oh, uh, are you? Something like taking me off there. I was trying to name someone else that talked before. Yeah. And you ruined my flow there, man. Sorry, sorry boss. It, yeah, you just ruined my flow. But where it's that scalability that you're there to put out the fire and you have to have that experience. What's this, this, this guy right here? Uh, Edward was saying about having that experience and knowing which technique to go for and which way to do it. And I think that all rates into the scalability. Um, we use, we went to um, 75 uh, PSI and also combinations maybe like four or five years ago, been the best thing ever. Um, I'm shocked I haven't heard anybody in this conversation talk about a pistol grip. We bought pistol grips and all the fires still go out. So I can't help the people that think they're the stupidest thing, whatever, that's what I got. But the fires go out and, and having that ability to move the line and work with the right pressures has been great for my department and staffing. Four person engine companies. Uh, we went from three person all the time when I started, so now we're almost up to four person most of the time. Huge difference in moving that line because I can stay with the nozzle as an officer and be right back and forth with the camera and have someone pull in the hose as opposed to having to run back all the way outside and move the hose. It's all that scalability, man. Kyle, do you got some ways that you got buy-in from your guys? Uh, I've got some suggestions too. And, and please, if somebody else has got some, some insight on how to get buy-in with the guys, here's how I got buy-in is, and when I got some resistance from other crews from changing stuff, we videotaped everything. <laughs> and, and that's when I called Pip and I'm like, okay, maybe I'm fatter than what I thought I was. Well, the camera adds 20 pounds. No, you're just really that fat. But, but I, I would venture to say if you videotape them, because, I mean, the videotape don't lie. I mean, Chief Fulmer sent me some great videos of him in his front yard with a sandbag attached to a 25-foot section of hose getting after it. And I really think it takes not, – not that I'm here to embarrass Corey or, or Kevin over there, but it's it just how else can you get by him when you show them that what you're doing just don't work? 
please, anybody jump on with that. Kyle, anybody? You have to show them it working. It's not that it doesn't work. You have to show them it working. And oh. sometimes it just takes time. You know what I mean? Like, it's not what doesn't work for you. It's right. what does work. I mean, the same with us going to the new nozzle, showing that, like, and, and sometimes you don't even see it. I think when we went to the new nozzles, maybe like four months in, uh, an engine company officer was like, yo, anybody notice the fires are going out a lot better, faster these days? And everybody's like, oh, some fire. Yeah, fire. Yeah. Oh, a lot of fires went out. Guess why, guys? We can move the nozzle now. You're not getting, you're not screaming on the radio, lower the pressure. So it's a show and you've got to fight it through. Chief Former, how'd you get your guys buying in? I mean, all. I mean, ultimately, it comes down to the officer, like I said. If the officer isn't bought in and doesn't care, then it's going to trickle down to the crew. Um, and, you know, I've said it in the past, one, one man can start a revolution. You know, so if you got a you got one guy in your department that's totally bought in and is passionate, is willing to put in the work, it's going to be contagious. And those that, you know, don't fall in line, well, then they're going to be on the outside looking in. You know, they're going to be looking at those crews that are putting in work, learning, having fun, and they're either going to, you know, like I said, jump on board or they're not. And those guys that aren't, then we're going to pass them in the front yard. We're going to mask up for them. We're going to take the nozzle. We're going to make the push. We're going to put the fire out. That's all there is to it. <laughs> Somebody put it in. Michael, you can unmute yourself there. What about a backseat firefighter trying to get buy-in from the bottom? And maybe Corey's got some stuff to add here. Because Corey's in the jump seat too, but listen, don't make excuses just because you're in the jump seat. I mean, if you can't get your officers to buy in, go ask them some questions. Hey, Cap, hey, Lou, can you show me this? Can you explain me that? And Corey, I know that you're doing a lot of stuff uh, even back home from the, from, the, from the back step. I mean, can you guys give some uh, suggestions to Michael for that about getting buy in from the bottom? Yeah, I mean, you're not, as the probie, you're not going to be able to force buy in even if you have a background from somewhere else but once you get a couple guys under you start with them so it's kind of Ooh. you gotta work both ways i worked down first because once i got a couple guys under me it's like all right well we're gonna drill and we're dr drilling like this and this is how it's gonna go and then as the senior guys see that oh well the junior guys are drilling and i don't want to be seen back here on the couch so i'm gonna go drill with them and then they bring their experience to the table. Well, why don't you do this? Or let's try this. Or we had a bad fire. It went this way. Let's try doing that. And then the officers come down out of the office. And they're done with their stuff. And everybody's doing something eventually. But you got to kind of hit the middle a little bit. You don't have to be like middle, middle. But once you get, I had four guys under me. But I'm working with one or two of them. I can drag them along. And then the senior guys don't want to just sit in the back and watch. They come out and we start doing everything and then Kevin. come up and the interesting thing with where I am is when the bosses get promoted they get moved around so I have two bosses that worked in Manhattan one worked just on the other side of the division line so he worked in our neighborhood another boss works Staten Island and Brooklyn South so we got three neighborhoods covered plus all the experience from the guys in our neighborhood so, Kevin, you, you wrote something here. Th thanks for sharing that, Corey. I, I, I really look to you for what – going down, I think, is a great place to start. And it's easier for Chief Fulmer to go down because he's close to the top. But even if you're at the bottom, start working your way down. I think that's some great. But, uh, Kevin, I'll give you some advice on this. I'm oh, sorry, somebody else? Go ahead. Oh, I, I, I don't I – I don't want to chip in too much here, but, uh, like I'm a, I'm a pipeman, so I'm not an officer. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of, I'm from the back seat and we've made a lot of change in our area. Um, and I think from the back seat, you've got to be really, really careful of how you come across to people. Mm. Um, one of the, one of the big things that, you know, we're not, I'm not going in there and telling a bunch of guys who have been to a, a lot of fires in their careers, hey, you've been doing it wrong. And I'm, I'm not going to over-dramatize this thing to where they, because they, these guys have seen, like, I'm, I got to recognize these guys have seen uh, a lot of stuff come into the fire service and then it's gone the next year. And it comes in and go. And so to, to them, what I'm proposing essentially could be 
the next fad to them that's just going to blow out and uh, and be gone in a little bit. So why pay attention, right? And like obviously, yeah, I don't uh, I don't think it's that. But one of the one of the things was making sure that we're not bringing this up as, hey, this is the the silver bullet pill that's going to put all the fires out and everything because they're going to go, well, okay, cool, man. I've been putting out a lot of fires for a long time and they all go out. And I can't argue that. Like, yeah, absolutely. You guys have been putting out a lot of fires for a lot of time, a long time and they've gone really well. But hey, here's uh, from a like our area is was big into thermal balance firefighting essentially which is you know don't hit it too much or else it's going to bank everything down it's going to steam out the victims all that kind of stuff and so we kind of had some like common ground there in with folks who were really struggling to wrap their heads around like flowing and moving versus a, a hit and move or like penciling type uh fire attack which one one of the th one of the things was that you go to these fires and really essentially what everybody does, they put water on the fire until the fire goes out. Like we can sit in a classroom and debate all these, you know, nuances of this thermal balance stuff in theory, but then in, in practicality you go on fires and you're like, man, we all just put water on the fire until it goes out. Uh, so nobody's, nobody's coming from an area that's that differently from, from anybody else. It's just in the classroom where we have these divisions. So we, dug into you know a lot of the ul stuff like what's best for the victim i think when we a lot of times with flowing and moving it comes uh from this perspective of oh i need to do it because the heat is so bad it's go it's it's hurting you know it can hurt me like that's why i want to flow and move and a lot of guys haven't had that fire and that's a tough one for I think that's a tough one for a lot of firemen to wrap their head around because if they haven't had it a lot of them don't want to admit that they haven't had it uh, and you know, chest puffs out all that kind of stuff. And, and that's a, a really hard road to go down. It's like, you're kind of fighting upstream. So you come at it from the victim perspective, like, okay, well, what's best for the victim? And like everybody around, you know, everybody understands CPR and all that kind of stuff. It's like, Hey man, nozzle open is continuous compression. Like that's what we do around here for our CPR, you know, do the continuous compressions thing. Like we're still, we're people still getting saved when we were 30 to two or when we were 15 to two, like, yeah, people were still, we still had a save rate with both those. It's not like people weren't getting saved, but now we, as our evolution of what actually benefits the person who's down on the ground uh, evolves, we understand like, yeah, man, an open nozzle cooling everything as, as much as we can, as fast as we can bring in fresh air. That's what's best for that person. So it kind of takes it away from their, personal experience which anytime you get a bunch of firemen in a room talking about their personal experience the the conversation is going to go south in in a hurry and then it turns into well you know who are you you've only been here x number of years and you know you're you know just shut up and do your job all that kind of stuff so i've found much more benefit coming at it from that perspective because then i'm not attacking somebody else's the way that they've been doing their job for 20 years so that's that's a losing battle for me yeah, hey, definitely a lot of great takeaways there. And if you guys, you guys are reading the chat over here, somebody, you guys are blowing me away with your stuff. Buying is kind of hard to get from my crew. Three weeks ago, he got recently promoted as a captain. Dude, let me tell you, I'm living that life right now. I mean, as a newly promoted engine company captain, first I started with a discussion, but then after a discussion, it comes with moving to doing stuff. I mean, you've got to get – I. I don't want to get too far off the nozzles while we're here today talking about that. It always ends up that we always go to human behavior, not fire behavior, Cal. <laughs> it really does. Because, I mean, flowing water and moving hose lines is the easy part. Dealing with jack wagons is the hard part. And, hey, I, I might be a jack wagon sometimes. But, I just want to try to tell guys is there's a literal playbook for operations. Yes. Like, literally, I was handed a playbook day one, or at least I was. And that playbook, if followed, will – deemed successful right but there's no playbook for personnel issues on the delivery of that message but there can be a playbook for disciplinary actions and that can Ooh. guide you into coaching situations versus disciplinary situations and that's where a lot of guys have trouble finding the line you know because writing paperwork on someone whether good or bad is either going to be really easy for you or it's going to be difficult for you. And you got to find that fine line between those two things. So like for me, it's real hard for me to find 
and wow, we've gone way left from where we started here, but good information still. I find it hard to write good about my guys when they perform to my expectation level. It's like when my guy shows up and the air brake hits and he nails the stretch, you know, I find it hard to write him up for nailing that stretch because that's the level of expectation, you know, and I find it tough sometimes to find that, you know, above and beyond to because the expectation level is here. The head of my organization level has an expectation level up here, knowing that we're here on the delivery of that expectation level. But it's set as a goal here to chase not perfection, but excellence. You know, we will never chase perfection. Nobody will. Vince Lombardi told us that, you know, but we can settle for excellence somewhere in between there. And you got to find that happy medium. I, I, I'm going to reference back to Chief Fulmer on this one. And he, uh, Chief, number one, thank you for always answering my direct messages. I know that's normally like way wrong time for you. But it can also come down to personal responsibility. The only person you can change is yourself. And when you're smoking people in the fire ground, by the way, I was at 13.9 seconds on my mask up the other day, by the way. Champ of the crew, number one stunner, fat kid wins. That's right. But, I mean, I think you can do that by upping your personal responsibility and, and performance. When the rubber meets the road, when you're sitting there waiting for your fat captain back there who can't freaking get dressed, they're going to notice. You know, as a boss, if you're a do as I say, not as I do boss, right? you're not going to get the buy-in. If, if, you know, it, if you're out there putting in work with the guys, better than yourself, that, that's, that's what it comes down to. And, you know, sets and reps, I mean. Oh, oh, Chief. Hit your mute button there again, buddy. Yeah, you got muted, Chief. Uh, that's that's the host. The host is an idiot. All right, you there? You hear yep, me? Sets and Reps was where we lost Sets it. and Reps. You know, I, I watched a movie the other night called The Outpost, True yep. Story, out Great of Afghanistan. Movie. And there was a, a line in there that kind of relates to the fire service. You know, these guys are down in a valley, you know, sitting ducks. The bad guys are taking pop shots at them for weeks at a time. And the captain was like, hey, they're just dialing us in for the big one. So in the fire service, when we're out there stretching a hose in a parking lot or at the station or an acquired structure, that's what we're doing. We're just we're Great taking pot shots to set up for the big one. That's all we're doing. All right, Cal, I'm going to steer, I'm going to steer this back around. Uh, here's Ryan's opinion on that thermal balance stuff. It came for uh, – all right, quick question. Pop it in the chat if you know with it. The father of the fog nozzle, what was his name and what state was he from who brought Navy firefighting to the structural fire? Who was he and what state was he from? Throw it in the chat over there. That's right. Y'all mother truckers need to take notice. West Virginia on the map, baby. Hollers of Appalachia. All right. So I really think that where this, 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 this thermal dynamic stuff came from, the European model. And Kyle, I don't know if you study what they do. They do that pulsing of the superfine super fine droplets and i think that's where they get the contraction from here in america with our big fat droplets we're just the opposite of it can you speak to the why that's so important and, and i know the reason why i got lectured from aaron fields and by the way when you get lectured by aaron fields it's almost like getting lectured by kurt isaacson both of you shut up you keep your mouth shut and you listen it was a fantastic lecture and i can't thank both of those enough but explain why that's so important today in the american way of doing things are you talking about like why our model is greed based? Oh, see, I knew you was gonna have a lot to add to that. <laughs> our model is greed based because it has to be. Right. Our our buildings contribute to fire load, so the majority of their structures. Now, granted, I've never been across the pond. I can only go off of what I've read and seen. But the majority of their buildings that they're running fires in that I've seen are <laughs> limited combustible or non combustible buildings. You know, and the the box so to speak, is not adding to the fire load the majority of the time. You know, so I saw a, uh, a picture in some video of a parking garage fire the other day, uh, probably two, three days ago. And, you know, I don't know what the calculation was between their liters per minute. And, but basically they're, they're running a bumper line and the bumper line they ain't going to cut it in that fire. Mm -hmm. You know, so I don't know how many liters per minute you need to, to equal 265 or 300, but you need to get it up there. And the problem is, is that, like Dennis says, let me back up. 
like Dennis says, if we were to make water 50% less efficient, we would be able to find out where our real nozzlemen are and who understand water application and where it needs to go. Nice. You know, but the greed based deployment model for our water that we use is giving guys the ability to count failures as success. Like Jay was just talking about, we put water everywhere and the fire goes out instead of being intentional with that water, you know, and I think with the limited amount of volume that they're flowing, their intentions with that water are known from what their plan is, but they don't have a whole lot of cushion. You know, there's no cushion there for the overtime that they may need in that life or death situation, in my personal opinion. You know, so the, the model that I've seen for the majority of the fires that I've seen go not so well is either they've got two choices. Either they're going to make the room put the fire out like this, or they're going to be, they're going to have a struggle, you know, and their struggle could be limited if they had the ability to bring up that volume of water that they're flowing. Now, I'm no expert on European firefighting models, you know, but I can, I can say that I'm, I'm leaning towards a subject matter expert of the greed based over my career, nowhere near a subject matter expert that I would claim, but I'm leaning, you know, I've got enough years in my, under my belt. We make about 80 fires a year where I'm at and I'm able to see these things over and over again versus someone who makes five fires a year, you know, so nowhere near subject matter expert, but I can see the, the actions working. Well, and, and this is the lesson I got for, from Aaron Fields. This is not Ryan's talking here. And is the reason we attack the ceiling first with big droplets to hit the most superheated surfaces that, that's in the container as you go in. And I really think that's why everybody says water wins, water wins, water wins. I kind of regret, I kind of pushed back on that for a long time. Because if you take away the air, you don't need as much water. But the American way of doing things is just by making everything soaking wet. But what I took away from the big droplets is you're kill, you're cooling the surfaces and that way you're painting the surfaces as you go down the hall. And, and that's some, everything. Yeah. Instead of isolating one item at a time, we're using all five as yeah. soon as the nozzle opens. So yeah. you've got to be able to match the, the water to the building. So a buddy of mine, battalion chief from all get down to me this way. Imagine a single room fire. Heat is going to transfer to that building the same way water would. So take right. that single room fire, turn it upside down and pour water in that room. And the water is going to move through that room the same way heat would right side up. So we have Ooh. to be able to match our stream to the actual structure itself. If we want cooling like Jay was referring to earlier. So what got Jay in a bind there is that the back wall where he passed through that compartment wasn't necessarily addressed fully. And that's what ended up causing him an issue. And that's where he was referring to the 90 left, 90 right, 90 behind as well, is that we need to make sure as we're passing through compartments that it's finished. Just like, as I was referring to, SWAT team's clearing the structure. SWAT team doesn't clear 70% of the room before moving on to the next one. It's 100% cleared before they progress through the structure. And we have to think of that nozzle being a line of sight tool like that. And stream sounds come into effect there. So, Pip, the other the, the fire that you guys had that you were referring to, I'm, I'm looking at you. I don't know if you're in the same spot as, as you were. But that fire where you all had where you thought you were going to turn left after six feet but ended up having to go the full length of the structure, how did you discover that that hallway wasn't there? Did you all use stream sounds for that? Or were you all just feeling on the wall, didn't find an opening? Or did you all do the a camera? Screen? Believe it or not, the camera. But okay. I, I just threw, I threw the camera up into the smoke and was like, there's no door now. And then I used my hand yeah. and was like, shit, there's no door. <laughs> so imagine you got zero visibility Yeah. and you can't see the camera. You know, you got camera in front of your face and you can't see nothing but a glow. You know, yeah. how you're going to discover that is stream sounds, man. You've got to be able to have that knowledge base on the nozzle that if I raise the nozzle chest high and sweep from left to right, what do I hear? You know, I want to, I'm looking for a fall away sound towards the side of the building where the fire's on. So if I'm, I'm approaching the structure and I see fire in the AB corner, I'm looking for a fall away sound with that sweep to the left side of that structure. And I fall into the fall away. Does that make sense? Yeah, a lot. So stream sounds is a, un, is a unknown thing for a lot of people. And like Jay says, there's a, it's a nugget that's thrown in a lot of places, <laughs> but instead of a nugget, that's the key that a lot of people don't realize is in zero visibility, that camera does you no good. 
you know, on the nozzle, you're, you're feeling out in front of you. If the nozzle's open, that does you no good. You know, you have to be able to have that long distance relationship with, with the seat of the fire, like Aaron talks about and being able to do that and, and being able to navigate with that stream will definitely be a plus for you. Man. Can I add some to that, Kyle? Oh, yeah, I, man, I think, can I get an amen from the congregation? Kyle laying the smack <laughs> down up in this corner right now. Woo! Go ahead, boss. Yeah, the uh, – yeah, and Kyle, you're you're exactly right. Like, the stream sounds just – it's so important. Uh, like, the, the camera, it's – it's really nice to have it uh, oftentimes like in residential fires and stuff, we're moving so fast from compartment to compartment that the, the number two or number three on the line, whoever's behind uh, me is a nozzle uh, in order for them to come forward and, and bring a camera forward. A lot of times it just bogs down the hose movement. And so the, from the pipement perspective, like it's really important for me just to get really good at feeling stuff with my streams. Like I got a blind uncle. He feels stuff around with his cane. I grew up watching him with his cane. I use, you know, use the stream the same way. Like your feet, you can, you can feel the room. And the other thing that getting used to feeling the stream sounds and listening to him does is it, it tunes you in. Like you get used to measuring or, or keying in on like when I pass into a new compartment, new threshold, something like that. I want to start my stream back over, keep it up high, work the room back down, and I'm feeling out working high to low. Well, when I when I do that, it does something else on the backside, which is it slows the nozzle down. So in training, we move really quick. Oftentimes, we build this kind of like pace and cadence with our with our 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 pipe men that they're just bombing in there, and it's hard for the back end folks to keep up, especially in, in flowing and moving because we're kind of constantly moving forward, um, which then there's kind of this, this other thing that happens where the, you're trying to move forward, the folks behind you can't catch up, you can only go as fast as they can, you miss a lot of heat, uh, and, and we're, it's like when you go on a fire, you're actually moving probably twice or three times faster than you actually think you are. Like I, I'm just as guilty of it as anybody. It's been something I've really had to focus on slowing way down. And when you're focusing on stream sounds and understanding the the shape of the room that you're in, uh, and you're matching it up with like your exterior picture, your exterior read of what that building looks like, you're kind of got a visual layout of what's gonna what it's gonna look like inside. You set up, you start flowing, you're feeling it, you're confirming it. It slows you down and it allows them to load hose behind you because really that that last 15 feet like we talk about uh, earlier about folks pushing from the door all the way inside the building like the most common push is about 10 feet right and it's that that you're stuck in the hallway you got a room that the, the room is perpendicular to you it's shielded around the corner you just got to get that 10 feet to get inside the room well if you're moving way too fast and those folks can't get line to you then what ends up happening is you get jammed up right when you need it most that last 10 feet to make the turn and you're stuck because you bound the hose down on the corner because you're moving too quickly for people so posting up every time you move into a new space take that space flow water even if i'm doing a hit and move if i'm just going to shut it down and move forward i'm going to hit it recognize the, the the stream sounds of the space that I'm in and allows everybody to catch up behind me so that when I do need to make that push, it just goes seamlessly all the way into the fire room. Kyle, how can we get that, that stream sound? And maybe Chief Fulmer, and please, if anybody else wants to jump in, please just cl unclick your mic and go at it. I really don't want to be hogging the even though Cal's like laying the smile, I probably need to shut up and let Cal run all this. Because like, By the way, I'm taking notes. I'm not texting. I'm taking notes right now to cover with my guys. Uh, that stream sound is huge. I mean, that's huge. And, and yeah, all right, I'm going to share something. And this is one of the best things we ever, this department that sent me this, can you guys see my video here? One of the best things this department ever did, this is a, an East Coast fire department, was they got thermal imaging cameras that recorded video. Uh, and what we saw, what we thought we saw was not really what we saw. And, and it now keep in mind, I was on the truck company for this fire, uh, but we thought there was a ceiling right here. Well, come to find out the ceiling had already burned through. If I wasn't on the truck company and had a water with me, I would be able to hear that. So basically, Kyle, you and I were talking about this. This is breached the container. 
So the container, when I say container, it'd be breached out of the sheetrock. It's actually laughing plaster. But if you can hear those stream sounds, man, I think that's huge, huge for firefighters to listen to and say, that doesn't sound like a normal roof or a ceiling. And then how do you adjust for that? And by the way, this is, this camera is not whited out. That means everything on the camera screen is above 590, about 590 on the UCF 9000 camera. Go ahead, Cal. Yeah, stream sounds are so important, man. And even with a situation like this, like say, for instance, put this room on the backside of the structure. One of the things that we hit real hard in our command structure is we want somebody on the Charlie side. Right. So if you're on the alpha side of the structure and your buggy backed into the next door neighbor, uh, the, their driveway, you're not going to see the stream coming out of the backside of this house. You know, so you got to be able to get somebody in the backyard to be able to see that stream coming out of the, the roof line or the wall and make a report to the engine company that guys, your stream is, is outside the structure. You're, you're not hitting what you think you're hitting. And this goes back to what we were talking about, about the European model. This is the building adding to the fire load. Gas cooling is great as long as the box is sealed. You know, once we lose the ability to seal what we cool, this is a free burning fire. You know, the vent limited fire in America is limited, pun intended, you know, because our box is contributing to the fire load specifically more now than ever and with the flowing and moving strategy is basically we're trying to turn an exothermic structure into an endothermic structure back to where it was before we got there so basic knowledge of fire behavior the box absorbs the heat until it can't absorb anymore and then it pushes back at that point it's becoming exothermic we don't want the structure to be exothermic specifically in areas that we pass through I don't want the, the back room that I made entry through to, to have all that hidden heat that I didn't address, like Jay was talking about earlier. We need to address that as we progress. And knowing Starnes like you do, one thing that came up in conversations with me and him multiple times is the number 200 degrees. From the ignition handbook, the majority of what our, our contents in our structures are made out of begin to off-gas, not burn, but begin to off-gas around 200. So that 200 number in my mind sticks out is that I want to make sure everything is swept at below 200 as I'm passing through. And this is situations where I can't walk to the fire room. So conditions drive tactics. Plan A is walk to the fire room. The conditions that I find on the way is going to be how I'm able to progress to the fire room. You know, and, and being able to flow and move to turn those exothermic wall sightings into endothermic again we have that off switch in our hand to be able to do that and stream sounds is so important in zero to no visibility due to the camera not being useful structures that are large and open like commercial buildings great for stream placement with using the tick a small compartmented area you're looking at eight to, to 15 foot of reach usually in those areas unless you're talking about mcmansions you know so you're going to be able to hear that stream whatever it strikes and when it strikes wood and drywall and brick, they all sound different. So if you can get your guys used to flowing at OSB and then flowing at drywall and flowing at a brick wall and being able to determine the differences between those three in a metal wall or a metal roof, all those things are going to react differently audibly to us. And we have to be able to recognize what we're doing. You know, and if I find an opening, the first thing I'm doing is sweeping the floor under it. So if I'm chest high and I sweep across a room, and it's open, the very first two thing that I do is when I find that fall away is sweep the floor in front of it. And what do you think I'm trying to determine there? Got a floor or not. Whether I've got a door or a window is basically what I'm worried about. Because if I've got a doorway that's open, it's, it's nine times out of 10 gonna be a hallway or a doorway. So if I find a fall away chest high, the very first thing I'm gonna do is sweep the floor in front of it. And if it still falls away, that tells me whether I've got a window or a door or even a hallway. So a hallway is just a long door to me. It's a corridor. That's a choke point that I have to pass through. And the fire behavior is going to be the most aggravated at the choke point, which is even more of a reason for me to have an open nozzle there. So Kyle, what I think you're getting at too, though, is a lot of it, this all comes back to the way guys train. And Jay was saying, like, if you want to take the nozzle out in the parking lot and you race it down, like if you run through, I deal with a lot of railroad flat apartments, which the way our buildings are, room to room, Every room is pretty much a bedroom, but it does me and the company, it does company no good and every company in there with us, no good if, yeah, we can run that nozzle from 
that's 60 feet from rear to front and at 30 seconds. But if we put nothing out on the way there, we accomplished nothing. And now we're at multiple alarms and we lose a building or a block, depending on if we're in the frames or not. But luckily, my bosses and my senior guys, when we train, we have a park parking lot right next to the firehouse and hydrant in front. It makes it real easy. We don't have to pull off any of our stuff. We pull hose from the basement. We get a run. We just drop it there. So we take off. But our drilling, we don't drill on how fast can we move this nozzle. It's we focus on stream placement. You got to high the walls, make sure you get low. And the, uh, the city got big on making sure it's sweeping the floor. And I actually saw it in my medic program when I was at the burn center. They showed us a burn and this knee is destroyed. It's all glassy white third degree burns. And they go, what do you think this is? And a bunch of medic students were like, oh, we don't know. And they go, it's a firefighter's knee. We weren't cooling the floors, guys. We're moving too fast. So Cooling the floor is a huge thing for us because most of our construction is plaster over lath. And when you hit plaster with water, it drops, but it's still hot. And FDNY went through a period where guys were going to the burn center with knee burns. Why? And now there's posters around the firehouse. Cool the floor, switch which knee is down. I think that's a big thing. You gotta if you sweep the floor and now with all the drug problems we have in the area too, it gets all well, the paraphernalia out of the way, but also, the water coming back at you from hitting, hitting the ceiling is scolding hot. It's not. Obviously, it's below 212, but 211 is still water and it's still going to burn. So we focus when we do our training, and yes, parking lot training, but it's what we have readily available. We focus on being able to handle a line by yourself, advancing inch and three quarters by yourself in case backup has to go get you on. But we very much focus on the water mapping and I've been following a lot of the videos on water mapping. It's so more Corey, important it's, it's to me so, than speed going forward. It's so great you brought that up. This is Kyle's picture, by the way, that completely stolen credentials here. Never mind, he said it to me. This is a fire in South Texas. And the guys pretty much were crawling in top of it. Anybody want to take a guess how hot that floor is? That's the floor. And and Kyle, that's their hose line, right? That's two hose lines right there. That's one hose line right there. This is a fire that the A shift made here locally at my department. That's one hose line right there. So, and I mean, it's almost 300 degrees. So I can't echo that. But to add to what, what, what Kyle was talking here, this is a great video from Andy uh, that we did in 2015. And, and this goes to show you why the water goes like it goes. And listen, I'm the hoarder guy. I talk to what I know. We hoard it up a hallway and we let it rip. And I mean, it's like, this is really hammers home. How long do you think those contents are going to stay beneath their ignition temperature? And I think this is where I started to become a fan of flowing and moving, Kyle. And I know you've never seen this video before, but this is stacks of books, DVDs, VHS tapes in a hallway. And when we open up that front door, it gets above 500 really, 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 really fast. So I really think that I'll, I share this just so that I can hammer home the point is the thermography of it just goes to show you that everything needs to get wet soak it all down use your stream reach and while you're watching this video i'd love for you guys to share is there any way that you can develop those stream sounds while training uh, is does it come from the burn room or does it come from can you do it in a hallway how can you get those stream sounds kind of ingrained in your in your in your brain so to speak because I'm asking, I have no idea. Training goes into it, but you just got to be careful where you train with them. So if you're training in a burn building that's all concrete, the echoing in that burn building is going to be difficult for them to discern where that um, where that is coming from. So the best case scenario would be a vacant. And if you have an opportunity to, to have rooms in a vacant that have sheetrock versus OSB versus metal paneling, if you can secure a vacant and just make – adjustments to that vacant to put different construction materials on the walls in there they'll be able to start to discern the differences in between those and being able to get guys in the habit of like jay says take a hot minute you know so you don't turn into hot garbage and and figure out where you're going nobody likes to walk forward without being able to find out how they're going to navigate through it it's like he's talking about his blind uncle jimmy you know his blind uncle jimmy reaches out in front of him well we got something that reaches out 85 feet per second in front of us. And it's another thing that a lot of guys don't realize is how fast that water's moving away from you. And you gotta be able to work the room 
in order to make sure it's cool before you pass through that compartment. Can I add something to that? Go ahead, Jay. Please, everybody add something. Don't let us keep talking all the time now. I, th I think that was that might have been me. Um, I think tying into what Kyle's saying here about the stream sounds, I think that's where we as leaders and, and instructors need to add water mapping into uh, the stream sounds because you can teach both at the same time and really hit home everything that we're looking and what we're talking about here. Uh, I mean, does anybody disagree with that? Mm -hmm. no, but we, um, we hit on it pretty hard. Uh, like with our recruits, especially I, I teach at our fire academy with a, a bunch of other, you know, dudes who are really dialed in with this stuff and, and really I'll, I'll, like our, our building, our drill tower that we're training in to start out with, it's got metal insides. Well, this next academy, we actually, uh, one of the guys went in and redid it in wood. So that'll be nice to play around with, but it's always been metal and metal is really tough with stream sounds because you got, you, you've got you know, six inch and three quarter lines working in the building with different groups and it, it can get, you know, pretty chaotic, but they, they pick up pretty quick. Um, just the difference when you're in a metal tower, like a concrete's less echoey, you can get away with a little bit more in a, in a concrete building, but in a, in a metal tower, really what we've got to go with is what does a, what does the size of the room that I'm in sound like? And then what is an opening sound like all the way on the other side of the room? Uh, and that's about all we can get out of that structure because it's just too much. It's too echoey. It's too unrealistic. Um, we do, we're really lucky. We get a lot of acquired structures up here. We do a lot of acquired structure burns and stuff. And, and so before we burn in them, we try to get a, a bunch of hose training in them. Anytime you can flow water in a real building, it's definitely an advantage. Um, the, the exterior look as you're stretching the line going up to the building, like I think, it, you know, as I go through my career, one of the things, one of the biggest things I've learned is that there's a time to go like pedal down fast and there's a, there's times to slow it down. Like it's not just all pedal down really fast all the way through the end of the fire. And we were, we were talking about like slowing it down inside the building. Well, it's, you know, really fast to the rig, get bunked out, get on the rig, drive to the scene, you know, hop off, take a hot second, look at the building. Okay, cool. Size it up, stretch the line. Like I don't want to sprint through my, I don't like sprinting through my stretch super fast. Like I you know, want to be quick and move with a purpose, but I don't want to like bomb through it. Cause I get one shot to get it right. Then I get to the door. It's like fast mask up. And then when I open that door, I slow everything way down and I'm getting my read. Like, is it below? Is it on my level? Is it above? And then that layout of that building, like if I'm going to, if I'm going to hit it from the door, like I've got thick turbulent smoke at the door that, you know, not fire, but I've got thick turbulent smoke. That means the surfaces are hot. I got to cool them down. Right. Like that's read number one. Boom. So I know that front door likely leads to a, a big room. And I'm going to confirm that with my stream sound. So I'm going to start high and I'm going to work that stream back and forth and get a feel for that room as I drop it down. And then I come back up high again, work that stream down and then drop it. And I'm feeling for that corner or that doorway that I want to go through. And then once I, once I, if I'm going to shut it down, I shut it down. I move up to that corner, position myself, make that turn. And now I start all over again, start high, work my way down. Now I know I'm in a, in a tighter area. I'm in a, like a, a hallway or something like that. So I'm going to tighten it up from, instead of going big side to side, I'm going to tighten up my stream and I'm going to use reach because hallways are longer than they are wide. So I'm going to reach that hallway and try to start ripping water in towards one of the fire rooms. So based on where I'm at, based on where I'm entering in the building, like that front door, big room, treat it like a big room. I'm going to, I don't just want to drop it down and leave it. I want to drop it down, come back up again with the nozzle on and then drop it down a, a, probably a couple times. Sometimes I'll do that three or four times, depending on the amount of heat in that room before I shut it down to move forward. Hey, it's so funny, Cal, when we start talking about this and this is a, this is a video I shot from the exterior, but it's, it speaks to a lot about, I guess I never really thought about the sounds of that. So I shot it to show what the water spray it sounded like, but I guess I never really pay attention to what it sounded like. And it just kind of was like, you all just hit me up with an aha moment.
because that has a distinct sound. That water hitting that sheetrock was a distinct sound. So, I, that, and you'll be able to tell the movie. difference between that and being able to hit rafters if you move that line. So right. I know a lot of people don't like moving lines from the outside, but I got to get a read. You know, you got to get a read for where that is. And if I bring that line down and say, for instance, the joists are running perpendicular to my stream. If I bring that line down and it sounds like I'm shuffling cards, that tells me something about the top of that row. Oh, you know, and, and, yeah, and the same thing would be like it, when Jay's going into an unfinished basement, you know, those rafters running, he can tell which way those rafters are running just by moving that line either forward, you know, up in a vertical position or horizontal to get a read where those joists are and if it's finished or not. Yeah, so. that, that's a big read for me when I hit the bottom of the stairs. In the basement. If I'm, if I'm like, as soon as I hit the bottom of the stairs, I'm going down. If I'm unsure of whether it's finished or not and all that kind of stuff, I take my stream and I rip it straight ahead and I rip it side to side. And I can hear, like Kyle says, it sounds like you're shuffling cards in a, in a you know, a deck of cards. And you can tell which way the construction's going based on that and if it's finished or not. And it, you know, if it's unfinished basement, like I'm going to, whoa, let's pump the brakes a little bit and slow down and really take our time with this thing. I just no one else. Go ahead. Uh, one thing with that, uh, we ran into a couple houses, uh, Cape Cods, that actually had drop ceilings in their living rooms. And that's going to change your sound completely because you're going to go from having that drop ceiling that once that comes down, your sounds are going to completely change. So that's something to be cognizant about too. It, it, Kyle, can you teach the, can you, can you find a hole in the floor that way? I mean, I know that everybody preaches bouncing off the floor. The reason I bounce it off the floor, you all would not agree with. So I'm not going to tell you, but. <laughs> yeah, you can find one, man, but the holes in the floor and the floor failing are two different things you know so you can you can find a hole in the floor with a stream depending on how big the hole is and right. if you're cognizant to what you're listening to you know and if you don't have any obstacles in your way to be able to keep that from finding that hole i may go pull it up on my computer but, I'm gonna well, the, but the, I mean, hole, the holes are the tough floor, because you're coming at it from an angle like if the yeah. you know the the floor is here and you're coming at it and you're, you're, dro you're dropped down. Like the lower you are, the less likely you are to even pick up my, the angle that you're seeing that hole at is just so su it's such a piss poor angle for your stream and your stream is going to be hitting probably floor joists anyway. So the, the idea that you're going to actually hear it and recognize that with your stream, like, I, I don't know, man, I don't, I don't think I could do it. Not a, not a chance. I wouldn't pick it up. Jay, got to be a pretty big hole. Yeah, for a pretty big hind end. Jay, was it you that posted the videos of doing the knee walk with the with sounding the floor out ahead of you? Was that your videos? Yeah, yeah, and um, you know the the term sounding like this is something that's super misleading. The the term right. sounding the floor like it's not as much sounding because it, it, the term sounding kind of indicates that you're really like smacking that floor right. ahead of you. And some guys do like, I'm not going to argue against it for, for me. Um, like I tell people, I had a conversation with, uh, uh, Casey Corgan at, at Portland, the farm and ship conferences last year. And she was like, you know, is it sounding or, and we're, I was like, no, it's not. I'm trying to come up with the word. She's like, well, it's pr more like probing than the way that you use it. Like, absolutely. That's, so that's a good word for it is, I'm taking my foot. So I like weight back when I push. Um, and that there's a lot of reasons behind that. I won't, you know, go into like all the detail about why, but I really like weight back. Um, and if I stick my foot out, I can, I can catch furniture before I move into it. Uh, as you, as the nozzles open, especially, you know, you increase the nozzle pressure and all this nozzle reaction, everything else, your posture, like as you're moving through every little bounce, every little thing you bounce off of can throw you off balance. And as soon as you start going off balance as a pipeman, like the first thing your body does is it stops moving the stream. You just focus on like, I got to stay upright. And if you're, you're, you know, ultimately all the fire cares about is where the water's going. So if I'm focused on just trying to keep my balance, then my nozzle's not doing what it's supposed to do. So by probing out with my foot, I'm, I'm catching stuff that I might bump into prior to bumping into it. It's kind of like, you know, rubbing my belly and patting my head. Like you got to start with one and then add the other. Well, the pat in the head is the, the nozzle, the stream movement. Well, it, as soon as I start focusing, I can only focus on really these two things. 
this goes away and I just stick with this. Well, the, uh, the other thing is like dropping down stairs. Like you'll have, you know, you'll be going across the floor and you'll have like just one step down into a living room. Well, I've eaten it a lot of times on stuff like that, where I was cruising along, my streams open, I'm moving the line around. Your stream doesn't pick up that single stair drop or whatever it is. And all of a sudden you're boom, you're on your face and you got to shut the line down and restart. So Mm -hmm. I I really like to be able to probe everything out in front of me and catch stuff, move around it. And it allows me to keep my water on target. Yeah. I, I agree with Jay. I mean, everything that we do from advancing hose lines to searching, we have a, we teach a foot out in front. We search from the tripod position to, I'm not going to say sound anymore after I heard what Jay said. I mean, we sound the roof, so I guess we're probing or sweeping (laughs) the floor. Um, But no, I mean, that's what we teach foot out in front, you know, Um, we don't teach hands and knees anymore. We don't teach the, the ifs the way, you know, elephant trunk, hook my, hook my trunk on your tail. Here we go. No, it's, <laughs> we, it's not what we do. Yeah. Well, some of us chubbier kids have a little bit harder time than that. Just saying. <laughs> I have a lot but... to do with it. You know, like Aaron talks about having the jargon, you know, having, and just like Chief Foreman was saying, we sound the roof for sure. You know, that's a different level of pressure that we're putting on that area that we're entering than we would with the nozzle open out in front of us and and having to be able to have that determination between those two things and having a term to be able to describe them to where it meets across all avenues would is important, you know, and that's why most, most people have trouble communicating verbally with people in this business because there is no jargon. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, that's, that's like what we're coming up on the last 15 minutes, man. Thank you guys for coming on. A last minute. I, I know this is super informal. If it's okay with you guys, I'm going to post this up as a podcast, Kyle. Just because. Oh, <laughs> hold on. Let me get you up there, Chief Fulmer. <laughs> he's got the. He's got his nozzle. I don't have my fog nozzle here. Uh, my fog nozzle is normally sitting right here, but it's we've actually been using it. Uh, I can't thank you guys enough for jumping on. This is a last minute. Uh, I've been working a ton of overtime. I haven't got a chance to do a whole lot of this stuff. Hey, I like the silver one better, right? <laughs> Uh, anybody else, please, everybody give some shout outs about the day of the nozzle, the seven, eight today. Uh, man, thank you guys for coming on. Uh, I think there was a lot of great information shared here. This kind of stuff without an agenda is the best kind of stuff, man. In my personal opinion, having an agenda and having some stuff, some bullet points to hit are great, but organic conversations like this are the best in my personal opinion. Yeah. And the thing about it is, oh, Hey, I'll tell you what, I'd really like to do more of these guys. I, I mean, I've got, I pay for the stupid Zoom stuff, and I use it once a month for a podcast. Like, what the freak? We ought to be using this stuff more often. Uh, Cal, can you share some information where people can reach out to you at? I've been following your stuff like a freaking madman. My guys probably know you better than you do me because we watch your stuff on the television. <laughs> uh, you can get me through Facebook. That's the easiest way. Um, if you need something more intimate than that, I can give you my phone number. Uh, just reach out to me. You know, we teach all over the country with FD Tactics and Oath Keepers. Uh, Oath Keepers is a conference that we do in September-ish, depending on where other conferences lie in Ohio. Um, but we teach tactics all over the place. So we've got a truck cadre that we just added. Um, and that way, we're, we try to stay in our own lane. So if you order an engine class with us, we're, we're having engine guys come out and teach that. You know, if you want a truck class, we'll send guys that ride the truck out. You know, can I teach you how to throw a ladder? Sure. But I would rather you hear that from a subject matter expert that rides a rig that has the mentality of truck work. Jay, where can people, opinion. Jay, where can people reach you at? Uh, I mean, all, all I got is Facebook. So I'm not, uh, I'm not a super reachable person outside of that, <laughs> but, but uh, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. And I, I do a, a bunch of um, live fire. We do a bunch of acquired structures, the guys at uh, West coast fire training. So we kind of put together a little, little group there that likes to, lighthouses on fire and and uh get a bunch of footage so it feels kind of i was telling some folks it feels like when you're a kid and you got your buddies and you're just like you know uh putting together backyard stunts and and sending it that's kind of kind of more what we feel like so yeah west coast fire training or just hit me up on on facebook i'm on uh kyle on the engine company resurrection page i do a a bunch of write-ups there so 
dude, if you guys haven't followed the engine company resurrection, you, you need to get on there. And, and, and I apologize about putting so many freaking posts and I'm surprised Kyle's like, right, you've got to stop posting on here because it's like, it's just, it's just when you don't know, you don't know. I mean, it's like, I've always just been the nozzle person. Like, okay, I got the nozzle to go put the fire out. I want to be a truck first. I want to be on the truck someday. <laughs> well, now it's kind of flipped back around. So, I mean, if you guys want to share your contact information, hit the unmute there. Chief Fulmer, where can they find your stuff at? I, I, I'll follow your stuff too. Um, I'm on Facebook under my name. Also, Ambassadors of the Craft on Facebook, um, on Instagram, uh, whatever. Uh, like Kyle said, we both have the privilege of teaching at Oath Keepers. Um, if you've never been there, check it out. It's a great conference. Great instructors from all over, from the West Coast to the East Coast, Midwest, all over. Um, if any of you ever make it to uh, the communist state of California, hit me up. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, trust me, I'm trying to get out of here, but uh, I don't know if it's going to happen. But uh, yeah, thanks for uh, putting this on, Ryan, and all the nuggets, Kyle. Dude, learn something every time, man. And Jay, good info. Everybody's got good info, man. Yeah, there right you boys. Uh, hey, I'm gonna make my fog nozzle cartel hats. I'm gonna put the fog, the fog, the fog fighters. That's right. Uh, hey, that's cool, man. There's a spot for everybody. <laughs> we are an all-inclusive webcast. <laughs> All right. Hey, I, I didn't get a chance to make the signups for the Oath Keepers Conference. I'm pretty sure I'm going to make the day trip out to at least come shake your guys' hands and watch a little bit what you're doing, maybe be a, 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 an observer. And if you guys do me a huge favor, my main man over there is like the coolest haircut ever. He's doing some pretty cool stuff over there at 555 Fitness. So make sure to give my boy Pip a follow over there as well. Corey, I appreciate your friendship as well. I, I like talking. Sorry you missed out on the 1060, the 1075, and the 1077. So, I worked five days last week, and let's see, I worked, yeah, I worked Monday through Friday, getting stuck one day, and then they go to the 1075 the one day I'm off. I was like, <laughs> I'm like the whitest of white clouds. I did have a pin job the other day. Woohoo! Which, you know, very exciting being the, uh, the medically trained guy on the engine. I, mean, I got into the car, but <laughs> at least our, the, the chief told our boss we looked good. So, hey, it's all kind of line stretched. All right, guys, thank you for coming. Happy 7 8 today. We're going to get out of here. Kyle, Chief Fulmer, much love to the engine. Everybody, thanks for coming along. I'm going to post this up on YouTube and I'm going to repost it as a podcast. If it's all right with you guys, show some thumbs up if you guys are okay. Edward, thank you guys for coming along, man. This is fantastic. And Kyle, I'll shoot you a message here when I get up uh, here in a little bit. Maybe we can set another one of these up because I, I thought it was awesome. Yeah, me and uh, Chief Riley there has been uh, tossing around an idea of doing something like this, and I think it would be good to do something like this for ECR. Yep. Uh, obviously not specifically keep it there because um, we want to be able to reach out, but there's a lot of knowledge there, man. And uh, for anybody that's not a member, like Ryan was saying, become a member. Just be careful. The best thing about ECR is that there's 26,000 people in it. The worst thing about ECR is that there's 26,000 people in it. <laughs> so – you just got to be able to, to filter through the information and find out what works best for you and your department. Because not everybody's going to have the same um, abilities as everybody else. But um, networking is huge. And being able to find out some unknown knowns and some known unknowns from other people that have been through those situations is very beneficial. And that was the whole point behind creating the group anyway, was being able to have that networking ability and being able to share these things across the board without having to worry about all the negativity and all the bullshit that comes with social media. Sorry, I didn't mean to cuss. No, no, I, I think that's the best thing I like about the engine company is the guys are going to give you an unfiltered look at it, but it's not really bashing so much. Yeah. I mean. Well, there's I, something I, to do, but they don't last long. <laughs> <laughs> Is anybody going to ticket. water on the fire next month? Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be down there. Four guys that's going to be there. I just sent them a free ride. I got to schedule flights and stuff. Because I'm looking forward to meeting people down there. It's going to be my first time down there. So, man, Yeah, it'll be a good time, man. Best go, engine com conference in the country. Go spend some time with, with Chief Isaacson. I'm telling you. I, that it's Ray McCormick's a, retirement party, too. I don't know if y'all knew that or not. Uh, Chief, uh, Chief Isaacson, I got a chance to spend almost an hour and a half with him behind the scenes. And, I mean, that guy is – I can't even express how legit he is. 
I mean, just his approach to life. I was just like, I was at like a therapy session. I, I took more notes talking to him in like an hour and a half than I did in a class. Just, I, he's going to blow your mind. All right, guys, that's it for today. Thank you for tuning in. I got to give you my, I got to give you my sign out. Thanks for tuning in. Jump Seat Radio Podcast, the podcast that gives you views and opinions of the backwards riding street level. I'm riding the engine, the truck, and <laughs> podcast. We'll see you all later. Hey, guys, thanks for coming along and stay cool.